Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me. Box13 at greatdetectives.net. If you have technical issues with the show, email andrew at greatdetectives.net. And follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. You can also follow us on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do want to let you know about my wife's business, Ashira Clips. At Ashira Clips, my wife sells a wide variety of different headbands, hair ties, and hairpins to suit the taste of a wide variety of different women. They also have different sizes for many of these items to suit different head sizes and different hair lengths. So check it out at lilarose.biz, L-I-L-L-A rose.biz slash Ashira, A-S-H-I-R-A. That's A-S-H-I-R-A. Now it's time for this week's episode of Philo Vance. The original air date, November the 4th, 1948. And this one is the Herringbone Murder Case. It fits beautifully, Mrs. Wentworth. Perhaps a little sleeve alteration. Oh, but... Miss Collins, could I see you a moment, please? Of course, Miss Payne. Oh, excuse me, please, Mrs. Wentworth. I won't be long. You wanted to see me, Miss Payne? Yes, I do. Would you please come into my office with me? Of course. I just saw the sales figures for last week, Miss Payne. They're up from the same week last year and the year before. Yes, I imagined they would be. The, um, the year before was the year you came with me, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. I'll be here two years this month. Yes, that's what I thought. Come in, please. Thank you. You may uh, sit down if you like. Thank you. Now then, you were saying something about sales figures, Claire. About the fact that they're up. Yes. I imagine profits are up accordingly. How much would they be up if you hadn't been stealing from the shop? Miss Payne. Now let's stop the pretense. I know all about you declaring yourself in on the profits, Claire. Well, I... The only thing I don't know is how you're going to pay back what you've stolen. According to these records, the amount is $12,465. I needed the money, Miss Payne, and I had to have it. I'll pay you back. Will you? Then there isn't any more to be said, is there? $12,465 by Saturday of this week. That is all, Claire. Saturday of this week? But I couldn't if possibly... If I don't have the money by Saturday, I shall turn the entire matter over to the police. We have until Saturday, Claire. I have until Saturday to get the money. That isn't very long, is it? But perhaps it does give me time enough to find another way out. <laughs> Please come in any time, Mrs. Jameson. I'm sure we'll have something that you'll like. Goodbye. <laughs> come. Hello, Edith. Sydney. What do you want here? Job in the store, Edith. I need a job pretty bad. How the mighty have fallen. What do you think you could do around here? Anything. Anything at all. Stock clerk, maybe? Shipping room? Anything you wanted me to do. Hmm. You know, Sidney, if I ever needed any assurance of my success, your being here asking for a job would do the trick. What about the job, Edith? You'd better get used to calling me Miss Payne. You remember my last name, don't you? I remember everything about you. How you came to my shop, this same shop, five years ago, and asked me for a job. And how I gave it to you. Yes. Yes, you did. As a stock clerk, $12 a week, with a chance for advancement. You certainly advanced, and quickly. Hmm. Before I knew it, I was depending on you for everything. 
And then one day I found you had control of my business. That won't happen again, Sidney. The other way around, I mean. All right, you start as a stock clerk for $12 a week. And no chance for advancement. Want the job? It is... Nobody can say I don't remember my friend. Oh, excuse me, friend. <laughs> Miss Payne speaking. This is Tom Henderson, Miss Payne. Oh, yes, Mr. Henderson. I own the Paris Import Dress Shop on Fifth Avenue. I know. What can I do for you? I'll tell you what you can do. You can stop sending those snoopers of yours over to my store to sketch my imports so you can make them up cheaper. That's what you can do. Uh, so far as I've been able to find out, there are no copyrights on designs, Mr. Henderson. And besides... My designers just happen to think of the same models that you go to the expense of importing. Is that all? No, it isn't all. My business has been cut in half. I'm on the verge of bankruptcy because of your unethical tactics. You're going to have to stop, or I'll find a way to stop you. That is all. <laughs> Very excitable man. <sighs> now, where were we, Sidney? You were offering me a job. At twelve dollars a week. The same job under the same circumstances that I offered you five years ago. Not exactly the same circumstances, Sidney. You see, I was smarter than you are. And I still am. You want a job. You've got it. Now go on, go on, get out and tell the bookkeeper. Only leave me alone right now. I have troubles. Have you, Edith? I mean, Miss Payne. I don't doubt it. You can't push little people around without having words. Yes, my dear. One little person can see to it that you have one big trouble. Taxi? Taxi. Oh, good evening, Miss Payne. Oh, it's you, Sidney. Through for the day so early. Get me a cab, will All you? All right, Edith. I mean, Miss Payne. But I think I'll have better luck down at the corner. It's only a short walk. Shall I try there? You might as well. Oh, I'll go with you. Well, how did you uh, like your first day in what was once your dress shop? I didn't mind too much. You shouldn't mind, you know. You asked for a job, and I gave you one. Incidentally, you forgot to thank me. Well, I have a lot of things to thank you for, Miss Payne. Yes, well, I'd just as soon not hear about them. Well, here's the corner. What about a cab? <coughs> Taxi! Are all the cabs taken? In my present financial condition, cabs don't represent much of a problem to me popular corner we stopped on. Mm, people waiting for the lights to change before they cross the street. Sidney, what about that cab? There should be one along in a minute. Well, somebody else had the same idea about taxi cabs in this corner, apparently. Look there in back of us. The rather tall man. The one in the striped trousers and dark coat? Yeah. Who's he? Tom Henderson. You should remember him. He's one of our competitors. Only right now, he insists I'm putting him into bankruptcy by stealing his exclusive imports and copying them. Oh, silly fellow. Taxi! Oh, darn. Plenty of empty trucks, but not too many empty cabs. Oh, wait here, Miss Payne. I think I see a cab pulling into the car back there. All right, but hurry, will you? Go. <laughs> Somebody pushed her. Let me through. Oh. Look at her. By that dead. And I was with her only a moment ago. Poor Edith Perry. Who is it? Markham Vance. Well, come right into my private office, Markham. You alone? Yes, Miss Deering's out to lunch, and my other secretary's on an errand, so I'm holding down the fort all by myself. How are you, Vance? Well, thank you. And my favorite district attorney. All right, thanks. Uh, how busy are you at the moment, Vance? Very. Unless there happens to be a murder my favorite district attorney wants investigated. There happens to be a murder. In that case, I'm completely at your service. Details, Markham. What are the details? Well, Vance, a woman named Edith Payne owned a very successful dress shop. She was standing on the corner of Fifth and Main waiting for a cab when suddenly she cried out. And an instant later, she was dead under the wheels of the truck. Well, I follow that, Mark. We got one break on the case, Vance. A newspaper photographer happened to be in the crowd. He heard her scream and managed to get a picture of her lying on the ground. Now, you can see the figures of the people who were in back of her. 
but not their faces. The camera was pointed down at the ground, is that right? Yes. Uh, before I show you the print, Vance, I want to tell you what else we know in this case. Now, Sergeant Heath made inquiries and found out that a man who admits being with Miss Payne, but claims he left her a moment before, once owned the shop, but was now working for her. His name is Sidney Taylor. And he was with her at the corner. Yes. Uh, Sergeant Heath uncovered another suspect for you. True. A man named Tom Henderson, who was being forced out of business by Miss Payne. Uh -huh. Heath found out at the shop that he was intensely bitter about it. And, uh, well, that's all I can tell you. Now I need to picture the body of Miss Payne. Well, hmm. Doesn't seem to tell us much, does it? People are pretty hard to identify when their faces are not shown. But it can be done. It can? How? Clothes, posture, some idiosyncrasy of dress peculiar to a particular individual. Oh, I see. Yes, it can be done, Markham, and in this case, I'd say it had better be done. What's this? What's what? This figure in the front row of the crowd. The man wearing the double-breasted herringbone suit? Yeah. And what about him? I don't know. There's something peculiar about this suit. What's wrong with it, Markham? I'm sure I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't fit very well. No, 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 that isn't it. It's something else. May not be important, though. Markham, what kind of a man is this Tom Henderson? Well, from what I've learned, very stately, well turned out, and his store had quite a society clientele. Really? Then this conceivably might be his picture right here. Where? You see the cutaway trousers in the front row? Oh, yes. Henderson might well be wearing a cutaway in view of his ultra dress shop. Hmm. We can check that, of course. Mm -hmm. That uh, herringbone suit still puzzles you, Vance? Very much. I wish I could figure what was wrong with it. Well, Markham, I think we've spent enough time here. Let's go down to Miss Payne's dress shop and see what we can find out there. <laughs> You say your name is Claire Collins and you're the manager of this shop. That's right, Mr. Vance. It was I who told Sergeant Heath about the trouble Miss Payne was having with Tom Henderson. That's correct, Vance. She also informed me of the fact that Sidney Taylor, who used to own this shop, was with Miss Payne. How did you know that, Miss Collins? Well, I saw them leave together. I go in the opposite direction, but I saw them walk toward the corner together. Well, that's logical enough. Uh, you may go if you like, Miss Collins. Only, please don't leave the store. You're an excellent source of information, and I'd like to keep you handy. <laughs> Glad to be of assistance, Mr. Vance. Oh, just one moment, Miss Collins. Hmm? Uh, would you take a look at this picture, please? Certainly. Well? Do you recognize anyone in this picture besides Miss Payne, of course? Well, how could I? There aren't any faces shown. You didn't think you'd be able to pick anyone out, but there was always a chance. Miss Collins... There was no bad feeling between Miss Payne and you, was there? Of course not. Thank you. You may go now. I'll send for you if I want you. All right, Mr. Vance. I'll be where I can be reached. Well, that's attractive, isn't she? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I see you're looking at Miss Payne's daily calendar. Anything there? Not yet. Just routine appointments, I'd say. Mm hmm? What's this? Mm, it's what? On this page. Take a look, Martin. The page reserved for Saturday of this week are these four letters. What do you make of them? Well, they look like... Well, that first letter looks like a P. The second is definitely an I, and the last two are two C's. P-I-C-C. -C. What does that spell or stand for? I don't know yet. But that first letter isn't a P, Markham. The first stroke is curved, not up and down. And perhaps it's code of some kind. No, no, I think I know what it is now. I'll give you this much of a hint. The CC, those last two letters, unless I'm very much mistaken. Which you rarely are. Thank you. <laughs> Stand for Claire Collins, the young lady who was just in here. Oh? And the first two? They're shorthand symbols, Markham. Pittman shorthand. Transcribed, the notes under Saturday's date read... Last day, Claire Collins. Oh, <laughs> 
This is District Attorney Martin. The Herringbone murder case opened with the finding of the body of Edith Payne, dress shop owner. She had apparently been pushed under the wheels of a truck, and a newspaper photographer passing by had snapped a picture almost immediately after the accident. No one in the crowd that surrounded the body was identifiable. Later, at the dress shop, Philo Vance discovered a memorandum concerning the store manager, Claire Collins, left by the dead owner. Vance has appeared puzzled by a figure in the photograph, the figure of a man wearing a double-breasted suit. He hinted there was something wrong with it, and in an effort to find out what, I have gone to a photography studio. Of course, Mr. Markham, you close the coat. I'm sorry. Never do I photograph a man in a double-breasted suit with the coat open. Yes, yes. Always it has to be buttoned. Yes. Please. Of course, Mr. Birdie, of course. There. Now, remember, I don't want my face shown, just the suit. No face? No face. Forty years I have been taking pictures. This I never heard of before, except perhaps if this is to be a, a fashion picture. Oh, no, 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 hardly. <laughs> Very well. You tell me what you want. I take the picture. Thank you. Hold still, please. I'm sorry. One moment, and it will be all over. That's fine, Mr. Roberti. I have a great deal to do, and the sooner I get this picture, the sooner I may be able to show my friend Philo Vance some results. Yes? Mr. Henderson, there's a gentleman in the outer office who wishes to see you. He says his name is Sidney Taylor. Taylor, huh? Fine, send him in, please. Sidney Taylor coming to see me. I wonder... Mr. Henderson? Come in. Come in, Mr. Taylor. Sit down. Thank you. You know me, Mr. Henderson? I know about you. You once owned the dress shop Edith Payne was running. That's right. I had no love for her, Mr. Henderson. I have no feeling of remorse now that she's gone. Remorse? You mean you killed her? Mr. Henderson, how much do you think the police would like to know that you were on the corner in back of us when Edith Payne was murdered? If they knew that she was ruining my business, I imagine they would be very interested. If I were there. No, you were there, all right. I saw you. Only I have no intention of telling that to the police. No? No. And this isn't blackmail or a threat of any kind, Mr. Henderson. I just would like a job in your store. I know the business very well, and I could be valuable. Hmm. It isn't blackmail, but you want a job, or you talk. That's right. Sorry, Mr. Taylor. If you'd come here an hour ago, I might have listened to your proposition. An hour ago? Yes. You see, Philo Vance is here. He seemed to know I was on that corner. Something he figured out from a picture. There's nothing you can do to me or for me, Mr. Taylor. I'm in this thing right up to my neck. I just dropped into your office for a moment, Markham. I want another look at that photograph of the crowd at the death scene. Uh, that double-breasted herringbone suit still has you stopped, Vance? I wouldn't say that exactly, Markham. What about that mysterious memorandum you deciphered from Miss Payne's calendar? One that read, Last Day, Claire Collins. I'll get to that in due time. Vance, I am quite convinced that you know more about the solution of this case than you're admitting. Why the reticence? I'm not holding back because I want to be secretive, Markham. It's true, I have a definite idea as to who killed Miss Payne. But you're the district attorney, and you're liable to become prejudiced against the person who I think is guilty. If you think he's guilty, Vance, I guarantee he is. That's just what I meant. I'd rather wait until I had proof. Just as you say. But I felt a little unhappy about that herringbone-suited figure. You mentioned there was something wrong with the suit, so I had a picture taken of myself to compare with it. And you found that there was a difference in the way your suit was buttoned and the way the one in the group picture was buttoned. You knew that, Vance? I realized what was wrong with the herringbone suit after I left you, Markham. I'm sorry you went to the trouble of having a picture taken. <laughs> so am I now. Do you think that the herringbone suit is important, Vance, in the solving of this case, I mean? Important, Markham? No, I wouldn't say it was important. I'd say it was vital. Oh, 
Officer Philo Vance, private investigator. Miss Gorham speaking. Miss Gorham, this is Mr. Vance. Miss Deering there? No, she's not. She's doing some research at the library. Can I help? Yes, you can, Miss Gorham. I'm going to give you the home addresses of two people, Sidney Taylor and Thomas Henderson. I want you to use some pretext or other and get into their homes. I want to know whether either of them owns a double-breasted herringbone suit. I'll try to find out, sir. Good. Oh, give me the addresses, Mr. Vance, and I hope I find the herringbone suit for you. Frankly, I hope you don't. Oh? You see, I'm going to see a man whom I don't know, doesn't know me, but who I think can supply the ending to the herringbone murder case. <laughs> Yeah? How do you do? My name is Vance. You don't know me. No kidding. Of course I don't know you. And I let you in on something. It's okay with me. Just one moment, please. I'm not selling anything. That's good, because I'm not buying nothing. So suppose we start by you knocking on the door, and this time I'll ignore it. So long. Wait a moment. Just one moment. How would you like to make $50? Oh, I see. You're not selling anything. You're the one that's buying. That's right. $50 worth of the answer to one question. <laughs> Rather, this beats those radio quiz games. You've got to work up to the big money question on them. Well, what is it? Do you own a double-breasted herringbone suit, and did you let somebody else wear it yesterday? That's really two questions, but I'll let it go on a corner. There's only one answer to both of them. The answer is yes. Thank you. Here's your money. You've earned it. I have. Well, what do you know about that? Hey, call again, will you, Mr. Vance? Call again. <laughs> Where is Vance, Mr. Markham? I'm not used to standing on street corners I'm like sorry, Miss Collins. Apparently, Mr. Vance has been delayed, but he'll be here uncertainly. Why don't you join Mr. Taylor and Mr. Henderson? They don't seem to mind waiting. Look, I don't care what they mind. All I can tell you is that Mr. Vance asked that you, Taylor, and Henderson be here. Hmm. Here comes a truck headed for this corner. I thought I left orders for no traffic to come through here. <laughs> Maybe the truck is getting restless, too. That isn't the reason. Look who's riding with the driver. Vance. What happened, Vance? Didn't you get a cab? Hello, Markham. Miss Collins. Sorry I was delayed a bit. Well, I see you have Mr. Taylor and Mr. Henderson waiting. Yes, Vance, I have. Uh, what's this outdoor meeting for? You should know by now, Markham. You mean this is the payoff? You know who killed Edith Payne, and you're going to prove it. Make that I hope to prove it, and you'll be right. Um... Call our two friends over here, will you, Markham, please? Of course, Vance. I'll go get them first. I hope you have a good reason for all of this, Vance. I have, I assure you. Now, you all want to know why you were brought here, don't you? Of course we do. You're entitled to that information, Mr. Henderson. This is the corner where Miss Payne was pushed under the wheels of a truck. I know you were in the crowd, Mr. Henderson. So please stand where you were at the time. Well, I'm not sure exactly where I was. I am. I studied the photograph taken at the scene a dozen times. You were immediately in back of where Miss Payne had been standing. Right there, please. All right. Thank you. Yes, but what am I doing here, Vance? You, Miss Collins? Yes, me. I told you I wasn't here when Miss Payne was killed. I'd gone the other way, to the subway. Yes, you did tell me that, didn't you? It must have slipped my mind. Uh, Mr. Taylor, you were right alongside of Miss Payne a moment before she was pushed, right? Yes, I was standing right about here before I went for a cab. Uh, Vance, what about our mysterious man in the double-breasted herringbone suit? Where does he fit in this? I'll show you in a moment. I brought a double-breasted suit coat with me on the truck. Uh, Mac, would you hand me that coat, please? Right. Thanks. Now, Miss Collins, will you put this on over your dress and stand right about there? <sighs> All right, but I've never heard anything so ridiculous in my life. Perhaps not. Oh, uh... Button the coat, will you, Miss Collins? Certainly. There. Now what? Now, Miss Collins, I'm sure you won't give Mr. Markham any trouble when he takes you to headquarters. You see, you've just convinced me that you are the murderer of Edith Payne. Oh. <laughs> 
May I have this in very small pieces, please, Vance? The explanation of how you knew Claire Collins pushed Miss Payne to her death, I mean. Certainly, Markham. First of all, you're entitled to know how I knew it was a woman. I go along with that. It was a herringbone suit, Markham. The double-breasted herringbone suit you saw in that picture. It was buttoned the wrong way. Yes, I know. Buttoned from right to left. A woman buttons everything that way, from a blouse to a top coat. And a man buttons everything from left to right. I'm beginning to understand your logic now. You were convinced that the herringbone wearer was a woman. You wanted to know what a woman would be doing at the scene of a crime wearing a man's suit. Right. She probably wore it so that if she had to skip in a hurry, witnesses would say a man was seen running away. She didn't have to run because apparently nobody saw her push Miss Payne. But Vance, any woman could have been wearing a man's suit. Why did it have to be Miss Collins? Markham, where would a woman get a man's suit? Hmm, rent it. Or buy it, I say. Renting it would be dangerous. The suit wasn't new, so it wasn't bought. Of course, it could have been a second-hand suit that was purchased, but fortunately it wasn't. Well, how was it done? It was borrowed from a neighbor, just as I thought it would be. I went to Miss Collins' apartment house and questioned her neighbors until I found a man who'd loaned her his double-breasted suit. Then, when I rode up on the truck this afternoon, I had her put on a coat just to make sure she buttoned it as all women do, from right to left. Yes, yes, I understand now. Uh, Vance, do you know why Miss Collins killed Miss Payne? No, I'll admit I don't know the motive. Well, then, for a change, I can tell you something. It seems that Miss Payne had given her until Saturday to return the money she had stolen or be turned over to the police. She couldn't return the money, so she did away with Miss Payne and would have been in the clear if it weren't for you. <laughs> a lot of people must hate you, Vance. Most criminals do, I imagine. Uh, you're not included in that not-so-select group, are you, Martin? Me? Oh, no, Vance. I'm on your side. I'm one of the many who want to see you operate and wind up mystery, just as you wound up a herringbone murder case. Welcome back. All right. So, moral of the story. If an employee has embezzled from you uh, an amount that they cannot possibly recover in the short term, call the police. Call your insurance company. Ultimately, our store owner ended up being murdered because she decided she wanted to see uh, the manager squirmed for a few days and fret and worry how she was going to come up with this amount of money. And for perspective, uh, what this was in 1948 dollars was obviously uh, more than $100,000. There was just no way that this money uh, could be recovered. And even if she hadn't opted the murder route, a uh, more uh, obvious thing to do as a manager and already being uh, guilty of and likely to be wanted for armed robbery is to take more, you know, either embezzle or steal merchandise. In this case, though, she opted for murder. Now, let's talk about the solution to this case. It is pretty much nonsense. The key clue is that our murderess borrowed a herringbone suit 
from a neighbor and buttoned it on the left revealing that it was a woman, not a man, wearing the suit. The problem with this is, as far as I can tell, that's not possible. I did an experiment with my wife. I had her put on one of my jackets. There is only one way to button it because that is where the holes are. Now, unless they change jacket designs wildly, I've seen enough movies and enough pictures to say that it hasn't really changed that you have a button on one side, you have a hole on another. You button the jacket by putting the button in the hole. Now, it's a double-breasted suit, but really all that changes is that there are some decorative buttons. So I suppose she could have turned the jacket like inside out and backwards and maybe buttoned with a decorative button. But, you know, I, I don't think Markham would need Philo Vance to tell uh, him that this was a problem. Now, a way this could have worked is if the picture had revealed that she was wearing the belt on her lap. It'd be perfectly believable as a woman used to... Uh, having belts and buttons and everything go on the left, that when she put on the belt for the trousers, that she belted them on the left rather than on the right. That just wouldn't lend itself to the dramatic reveal. So we get a dramatic reveal that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I also think that her asking the neighbor was probably one of the more conspicuous things that she could have done. Because it's really not typical for people to borrow clothing from people of the off opposite gender, particularly if you're talking like a full suit. And you're going to offer some explanation, which either way, it's going to stand out in the mind of the person you're borrowing from. So it would have been far wiser to go and grab something from a secondhand store, which uh, Vance admitted was an opportunity, but she chose not to for reasons. At any rate, I've had my bone, or should I say my herring bone, to pick with this episode, but I'll go ahead and leave it at that and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Emmett, Patreon supporter since March of 2018, currently supporting the show at the uh, Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Emmett. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this episode on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. Next week, we'll have another episode of Philo Vance. But tomorrow, we're going to check in with the man with the action-packed expense account, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, where... Expense account item one. $45.95, plane fare and incidentals between Hartford, Connecticut, and Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Expense account item two, 75 cents, cab fare to the local police station, where I introduced myself to Captain George Lane. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Mr. Martin from your company called, told me to expect you. How can I help? Well, to begin with, you can fill me in on the details. Sure. You ever been to the Snows? The Snows? The Chino Islands. Oh, no, no. Well, there are a whole group of islands on the fringe of Lake Huron. Lake Chino means the channels. It's somewhat of a resort now, but very exclusive. People who go to the snows have been coming up for years. They own homes on various islands and altogether a very respectable community. Alfred Chambers rented the Forester Cabin. It's one of the islands furthermost from the mainland, about uh, two miles, I'd say. He spent three days in the snows, and then his wife arrived from Pittsburgh. Mr. Schoenberg, fellow, has a boat rental service, took her out to the island, and she found her husband lying in the living room, dead, shot through the chest. Any suspects? Not a one. Mrs. Chambers told me she'd separated from her husband about a week before he'd come to the snows, but she couldn't have killed him. Schoenberg was with her all the time. And according to the coroner, Chambers had been dead for about 14 hours. Until the investigation's cleared up, I've been making my headquarters at the hotel at the Snows. I just came in to get the coroner's report. I was going back this afternoon, if you'd care to come along. Yeah, I'd like to. 
I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And don't forget our Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.